Two. All right, we're live. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited about this one today because I actually I know a little bit about this subject, not not in detail like this man does, but I'm oh, I'm down that. with this kind of stuff. So, yeah. That's, uh, but first, we're going to talk about plants a little bit, and then I I was running a little late today, so I'm going to uh, get his presentation up while we're talking about plants. I'm going to ask him a few questions, and we'll just listen to what he has to say while I'm doing a little background work. So. Hey, good to see you, Sean. You too. All right. Glad you're back. All right. So you were telling me a little bit about a medicinal garden that you were uh, growing. Can you tell us what you what you have in that and like how far along it is and all of that? Yeah. So right now, I um, basically I started with valerian, and uh, that's going pretty well. I've had a couple struggles with uh, some really intense heat, so I had to make sure I moved it around and got it out of the sun a little bit. But um, yeah, basically I. Right now from seeds, I've started like a, a tea garden, which uh, contains lemon balm. There's a lemon basil in there. And uh, there's also a Greek tea tree. So a lot of this stuff, honestly, I don't know a lot of the plants off the top of my head. So I, I trusted that medicinal seed company, uh, Strictly Medicinal Seeds. Oh yeah, uh, great source. I've yeah. used them. And I've had a lot of success with their, with their, with their seeds and stuff. So I bought like the the tea pack and the the Chinese uh, traditional medicine like package. So I was just playing around with those, and um, once they get to maturity level, I'll try to start extracting and maybe even isolating some of the desirable compounds, and who knows, go from there. So. All right. Cool. Cool. I have another plant that I want to. I hope that you dive dive into sometime. We'll talk about that a little later. I'm. I mean, I do okay. have the seeds for fever few, but I haven't, I haven't quite gotten them going yet. Okay. Well, I've got plenty of flowers of that too. Is when I, when the weather gets uh, better and I can send you those valerian roots, I also I'll send you some uh, fever few flowers also. Cool. You can play around with that, but uh, it, that stuff really works. And it's, it may be like a simple compound that like everybody already knows about, but I don't know what's in that that makes it work. It's, it's essentially just an anti-inflammatory. It's since you have right. it, you probably already know a little bit about it. So. Yeah, off the top of that, my head, I forget the compound, but there was a, a major component that was linked to the anti-inflammatory. It was like the aspirin of the 18th century, from what I read. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it works. It works on migraines too. It does yeah. nothing really like cures a migraine, but it really takes the edge off of one. That's for sure. Right. That's all you need sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> for for sure. So okay, I got two of these, and then uh, there's a, wh which one are you wanting to start with, and I can like. I may already have that one down. So there should be one presentation. And then I emailed you uh, the paper that we'll dive into. Yeah, I got the paper downloaded and the, uh, uh, the I like this little uh, introduction to redox chemistry. It's real simple, two pages long. Like that's. That's kind of how yeah. I organize my thoughts. I mean, you we can definitely post that stuff if you want. I'm happy to share it. All right. All right. And, and I guess here's the presentation. Okay. That's in a different. Oh, right. yeah, I just sent it to you around 11 or so today. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> all right and uh, tell us a little bit about what you got from before we dive into all this stuff. Uh, uh, tell us about what you got going from Pete, man. Is what you what you decide to pick up from Daga? Oh, well, I got some of your seeds, uh, the Elka. And uh, I got some of Mr. Tree's seeds, uh, that ice cream cake crossed with that Kandahar Red. And then I picked up the... Uh, SFV cross with the Kandahar red. So I'm trying my, trying my luck with those guys right now and uh, trying to go through the steps to, to get to the, the female, save the males, hopefully get pollen and maybe do some breeding with some different stuff. Yeah, that's the, that, that stuff that Mr. Trees has. That sounds like that'd be good for breeding. I don't know if you would want to do that with whatever you got for me. I don't know. I don't know what the Elka is actually. Oh. What was the, was that what it was called? The Elka? Yeah, it was uh, the skunk <laughs> one cross with original haze. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I like that one. So, yeah, that's the. I was going to, I was going to get the Bobcat spray or whatever. I think you were sold out at the time. And uh, just because MSU is uh, the Bobcat, so it was my alma mater. Oh, oh sweet! Kind of <laughs> that that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, that's like uh, there was some pissy ones in that. I, I named it that just because it was kind of wild. Like the the other thing that I put out with that was uh, 
the uh, coyote scat. And I just that it it hadn't that name didn't really have anything to do with the strength of the pissiness to it. It was just a really good haze that kind of flowered a little earlier than the other one that you got, the one oh, that okay. you were able to get. The original times the skunk one, that one, some of those things just never finish. Uh, but the uh, that other one had gene in it, so it like it really knocked the flower time. Well, didn't really knock it back a lot, but enough. You know, twelve weeks is much better than sixteen to infinity. <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> so okay, let me finish what I've got going over here, and we'll get into that. It's like, so, uh, I know that you're you're more of you've been more into extraction than actually like growing stuff. Is it, am I correct about that? Like you, you haven't really you. How many runs do you have behind you? I guess oh, that's what. Like a half of one. Like okay. I, I had some plants and, and some solo cups that I kind of pushed the flower and just to kind of play around with, but I haven't really had a harvest yet. So it's, uh, all right. Hey, that's that. That's a fun time right there. You're going to learn a lot. That's for sure. And, it's, and you're, you're a smart dude. You're going to learn it quick. You probably won't be making the same mistake twice. Like some of us have, you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you <never> know. <laughs> uh, well, I got confidence in you. So <laughs> anyway, yo, shit, man, jump uh, you're jumping in the deep end with that uh, haze times skunk one. So you just, uh, you're going to have issues. So you just uh, feel free to ask me anything you want, man. Oh, right on. Thanks. Along the way. So, yeah. As the, I, you had some interesting questions the other day about uh, what you had just started off. So that's why I had it fresh in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. That's the, uh, you want to talk about plants some more or whatever the hell you want while I'm, oh. uh, I got to finish up the last end of this. So we're doing the presentation. Yeah, I mean, plants for me, it's a, it's a really cool little pastime hobby that then at the end of the day has applications to my more professional interests. So it's it's been a lot of fun trying to just, I mean, I just try to grow whatever I can. I'm not, I'm not like, oh, I don't want this plant or that plant. It's like, oh, let's see what happens. <laughs> it's fun, right. you, you know, <laughs> but. Right on. So this sharing screen thing is always a. I'm I'm not a computer guy. I'm a plant guy. So this all of this stuff is. I, I appreciate you and everyone else being patient with me on this, but we'll eventually get there. And I was I was kind of proud of us the way that we handled this the last time, as the with the uh, uh, me doing the uh, the scrolling and you doing the teaching. So as a, it worked out pretty well in my opinion. So let's see if we can do it again. All right. And it, it's here. Okay. Oh, I got the comments. Cool. Yeah, that's it. I'm trying to focus on the show. Let's see. Is it, oh, what's, I'll, answer, I'll answer a question really quick. Uh, what's the issues with haze? Uh, <laughs> really name it. But that, <laughs> it's really not that bad. But it's a, it it. it as somebody uh, already answered you, it does. Uh, some of them do flower a long time, and these are haze hybrids. I don't, I don't fuck around with the pure haze like some people do. So as I'm, we're not talking about pure haze here, but a lot of the plants, the uh, haze is very uh, strong and dominant. So it's a, a lot of them come out very hazy. It's hard to knock time off of them and all of that. So it's a, uh, and to keep those, you can knock the time off of them, but you're not going to like. For some reason, you lose a lot of the interesting characteristics that. Mm. I think that only pop up because they take a long time. Like it's, I don't think that the shorter flowering ones can, they don't have all of that extra time to develop uh, the more unique stuff that's, and it's hard to explain. Like there's nothing really that different that's in those plants that's in any, any of the rest, but there's, there's definitely a different effect. But anyway, uh, to answer your question is like there, uh, there's herm issues as, so there's that and the haze time skunk one that one it's still it, that one had had some herm problems but as far as the like that one the the one that had the least was the dream time and that 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 didn't surprise me and then there the haze time skunk one was it it was uh it had it but it was manageable it came really late and there wasn't a lot of them doing it real early and stuff like that is but so it's you kind of take the good with the bad on it and it's easy to uh, like select away from it and sometimes it's something you're doing while it's herming it's not it's like the genetics are prone to doing it but you're fucking up in some way and that's that's causing them to want to uh 
flip around on you. So that those two things, those are, are commonly known. And then there's like, uh, there's overfeeding. There's a lot of people want to overfeed and overwater that shit. And it really, it, it doesn't like it as you're going to burn it up. And it, even if it does like come, uh, come out for you and it doesn't get all burnt up, it's going to taste like shit. It's going to be, it's, it really, uh, it holds on to its nutrients. It's more close to the hemp end of things. So okay. it's like more wild and it like holds on to its nutrients longer. It seems than other plants do like the, uh, the outdoor that I have right now, none of it's haze, but it's all like, uh, equatorial stuff. Most of it. And, uh, it's, it's been selected and it's supposed to finish in, and it looks like it's going to finish in time. But what I'm getting at is that there's one out there that is more like uh i'm gonna if i want this one to finish i'm gonna have to like baby it it's not in the ground so i'm gonna be able to like bring it uh, in and out of the weather towards the end and hopefully she doesn't uh start rotting on me but what i'm getting at is that these longer flowering plants uh, because they hold you can see that they hold that uh the nutrients in them a little longer than the uh the short ones, the, the real quick plants is like, they seem, a lot of those seem to really burn through the newts, but the, uh, let me, let me bring, uh, let me land the plane here. <laughs> so this one plant out there is more longer flowering than the rest. And it's just, it's not going to finish naturally outside, but it's still the greenest. The other ones are starting to like, uh, get a little, uh, lighter green and the, uh, not quite yellowing out yet. It's not quite time for that, but they're, they're lightening up because it's that time of year, you know, and that, that one is staying really green and healthy because it's not, it's not that far along yet in its life cycle. So it, it's not right. time for it to start getting lighter. So that's, I think I landed the plane right there. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's the, those are a few problems with the haze. Like I said, you can kind of name it, but it's just like, don't over love them and they'll love you. It's, that's kind of how it goes. So, and that's with a lot of them too, is like, it, but anyway, so there's, there's my little rant on the haze and uh, let's uh, get to this, this subject because uh, uh, before you, you start going and, and teaching us here, Sean, I want to let you know, it's like, a, this is to me, this is the most important thing when it comes to like uh, organics. And it's like what we, how we ended the show the last time talking about what the bacteria and the worms and all of the small thing, the fungi and all of that, everything that they're doing is really where all of this happens. Right. So it's, and they're like a, your, your complicated way or the human's way of explaining what they just do is that that's very funny to me. But this one is pretty straightforward and understandable. Like we, like I said at the beginning, there's that paper that has the two, you just have that two page explanation of this subject. And as a, maybe uh, that'll be the overview after you're done, like getting real deep into it, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I kind of do that just to organize my thoughts, to make sure that I'm hitting like the progression and the bullet points. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> electrochemistry can be very frustrating and it's so easy to get things backwards you know the cathode and the anode and blah 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 and then when you get into the soil you, you don't you don't care so much a, a little bit you know um mm -hmm. about what your electrode is but um yeah it's been really interesting reading about this stuff and and i, I you know like you said it's a it's a huge parameter to to pay attention to in your soil i think as well and that that one review article that i sent over was um Basically, they're trying to couple pH and the reduction potential into one type of uh, graph or parameter that can be measured and monitored throughout, you know, your crop cycling. So, yeah, that's what I thought was most interesting about that is I've kind of known this intuitively, but I've never seen a paper like explaining that. And it's like a lot of us like, that have good soil and like just we we've kind of gotten lazy. It's like, you don't have to pH your soil after you've got something straight. If it's working and the right. plants look good, your pH is fine. It's, yeah. Unless you've got something weird, like you're trying to grow blueberries or something right. that likes like a little more acid or whatever. So anyway, it's like this subject has always been fascinating to me and it's going to be cool to 
like learn it uh, deeply with everyone here today. So that's a, I've always been fascinated with electricity since I was a kid, yeah. and I really don't understand why any nobody else like not that nobody else not that everyone is as fascinated with electricity as I am because it's kind right. of everything. I mean, literally everything. Like that's what we're talking about here today. Is like plants couldn't eat without this system that we're talking about today. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And what uh, uh, an uninteresting question before you get started, also is why are the, the capital and uh, lowercase letters switched? Like PH is P, capital H. And uh, yeah, can you explain that to me? What the I hell's was, going on there? I was thinking the same thing. Like, where do they come up with this EH, like abbreviation? Like, okay, electrical, and what? Like, <laughs> like, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but, but typically a lowercase P, at least in chemistry, is a negative log. So okay. like that's a convention, like a PKA is a negative log of the KA, a pH is the negative log of, you know, the H plus concentration. But yeah, that EH thing, I'm like, what, what the hell is the EH? Oh, reduction potential of soil, obviously. <laughs> like, All right. <laughs> well, let's, let's see if we'll, we'll learn it here. Yeah, maybe we can uh, figure I, it out. I, I, I hope the other, I hope the audience is as interested as this, in this as I am. So uh, I'll get over here. I'll highlight this. Make it big for everybody. All right. If it works. And then uh, you just tell me how to scroll. Yeah. So um, today we're basically going to talk about a little bit of electrochemistry, which is nothing more than chemical reactions that require some type of electricity, normally in the form of shuffling around electrons. Um, so if we go to the first slide there, so we always start oxidation and reductions are basically two, a couple of reactions. So you can't really oxidize something without reducing something else. It's kind of violates the conservation of mass and energy to, to move electrons without having some place to put them. Um, so when we're out, when we're talking about oxidation and reduction, you know, we combine the two words that make sense in this case to redox. So we have a reduction, oxidation reaction or a redox reaction. And this is where the stuff gets very easy to, to flip around. What's being reduced, what's being oxidized. Um, and some of the verbiage even contributes to that confusion. So this picture right here, if you look at it on the top, you know, it's molecule A has this, you know, a couple of electrons sticking on it. And if it loses those electrons, it's going to be oxidized. Conversely, if you look at molecule B, um, it's going to gain the electrons from molecule A, meaning that it's going to be reduced. So you have to have A and B present. You can't, like I said, you can't oxidize something without also reducing something. So this is where there's a couple mnemonics in this branch of science that are really helpful. And um, one of them is oil rig. And basically, it's oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. So if you're ever wondering what is being reduced or oxidized, if you know which one gained the electrons, then according to oil rig, it was reduced. Uh, if you know which, which compound lost the electrons, then again, oil rig tells you that it was oxidized because oxidation is loss. Uh, there's another one, Leo the lion goes grr. That seems really complicated to me. Oil rig, it's like, yep, I can remember that, no problem. <laughs> so, but um, so that's where, that's the first one that I would always keep in my head is to figure out if I'm losing electrons, I'm oxidized. If I'm gaining electrons, then I'm reducing. So to make it even more confusing, <laughs> if you look under molecule A, it's known as the reducing agent. The reducing agent is itself being oxidized, just like the oxidizing agent is itself being reduced. So the way that I always thought about this is that this is the agent that is going to facilitate the reduction by losing the electrons to donate to molecule B. And conversely, the oxidizing agent is the species or the agent that is going to be able to accept those electrons. So it itself is being reduced 
um, so that the other one can be oxidized. So reducing agents are oxidized. Oxidizing agents are reduced. So I think that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of redox chemistry right there is the shuffling of electrons and how we get from A to oxidized A and from B to reduced B. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Now these tables, you're gonna find them in any general chemistry book. And a bit, essentially they're normally always reported in reduction potentials. And reduction potentials are basically a voltage. That's the potential. Um, so if you have two electrodes sitting in a solution that has an electrolyte flowing through it, um, you can guesstimate the voltage. Obviously the conditions matter. What kind of concentration is in your beaker? Um, is the, uh, That's really the biggest, like what your salt bridge is, that might have an effect. But basically these theoretical values are more or less, they're all compared to the standard hydrogen electrode or the Xi electrode. And that has a reduction potential by definition of zero. And it's nothing more than some guy said, hey, I'm going to stick this electrode in, call it zero. And anything that's not zero is then the reduction potential of, let's say, lead two plus or four plus in this case. Um, so that's what the, this chart is telling you is that the more the the higher the potential, the greater, the, the, the higher the reduction potential. So they're, they're the same things. And the reduction potential is, is how, how easily am I willing to, to give up my electrons? I'm sorry. To, to, <laughs> how easily am I willing to gain my electrons? Uh, and conversely, if you're a reducing agent and you're being oxidized, then going down the table, you get to stronger and stronger uh, oxidizers. So these are a way, and if we go to the next slide, I think we'll make a little more sense of what these numbers are kind of uh, hinting at. But basically, you're going to make an electrolytic cell, uh, galvanic cell. And that's what this picture is. And <clears throat> the other mnemonic that's really nice after oil rig is uh, red cat anox. And all that is, is that reduction happens at the cathode and oxidation happens at the anode. So anox, anode, oxidation, red cat, reduction, uh, cathode. So here we have a silver electrode and the silver ion is going on to the electrode and it's like, you know, building up a, a layer of silver on that silver electrode. If you look at the copper electrode, the copper ions are being in, are being put into the solution as a two plus. So if I had to think about red cat anox and I want to figure out which one's the anode, I can see right away that copper elemental copper has an oxidation state of zero. And now as it goes into solution, it has an oxidation state of plus two. So we've lost two units of negative charge. So we've lost those two electrons, which means that copper is being oxidized and that's going to happen at the anode. Same thing as uh, if we look at the silver plus ion going to silver zero, if you will. So we have a silver plus one. It's going into its elemental form. So that oxidation state will be zero. So we're actually gaining one unit of uh, a negative charge so that the um, silver is being reduced. And that happens at the cathode, according to red, red cat anox. Um, the other feature is that you need to have a salt bridge connecting these two, these two um, beakers. There's no real potential until you connect them with a salt bridge. And if you notice in this salt bridge, they use sodium nitrate. So in a salt bridge, you typically want unreactive ions. Um, and what this is going to do is if you notice the flow, you've got silver nitrate in that beaker on the right. The negative nitrate ions are flowing through a porous membrane through that salt bridge and being 
you know, forced into the positive solution of copper two plus. So this is a way for that, that cell to kind of balance its charge and so that you can keep running this reaction, uh, not infinitely because eventually you'll strip all the copper off and you won't have an electrode anymore. And uh, you'll probably build up a, a plate of silver and maybe some silver oxides or something else that will tarnish that silver and you've ruined that electrode. Um, but this salt bridge, if you look at, you know, the sodium ions are flowing towards where you're losing that positive charge in solution. The negative ion of the nitrate is flowing so that you're balancing the positive charge on the copper side. So that's what the salt bridge does. And that's where you get the potential of 0.46 volts in this case. And if you wanted to do this mathematically, you'd go back to a table like we just saw of reduction potentials. And you can basically add the reduction potential of copper, let's say, which is 0.34. And the re reduction potential of silver is 0.8. And I think it's cathode minus anode is how they get the 0.46. So it's going to be 0 0.8 minus the 0 0.34, uh, and that should get you the 0 0.46, right? Yeah, 76 minus, the, yeah. So that will get you to your 0.36. So it's not really hard math. It's really just the difference. It's, it's like a driving force. You know, it, if it's positive, you know, in a sense, you're in uh, aerobic conditions. Um, that doesn't really work for this picture, but when we get to soil, it will definitely work really well to be like, this is aerobic, this is anaerobic. Um, but yeah, if you get a negative potential, basically all you've done is you flipped your cathode and your anode by accident. Um, so yeah, I think the next slide will... Well, before we go there, I got a few yeah. questions about this. Sure. So, like I said, I'm fascinated with electricity. I've never seen anything, I've, I've never seen anything like this salt bridge thing before. Like a, what I'm seeing here is like the, that you, you've built the battery is this is a battery. That's why yep. it's producing voltage. And this salt bridge is kind of like, how long will this reaction like keep going? How long can you maintain that half a volt? So you should be able to maintain that half a volt until basically you compromise the electrodes. Really? So as that, as that reaction is happening, you're, you're stripping that copper from the electro, uh, the electrode and putting it into solution. Mm -hmm. So then that allows the, the electrons to flow through the wire to, to, to make the potential go across the circuit. Um, but sooner or later, you're gonna run out of copper to keep that reaction running. Yeah, yeah, but that'll be a while. Yeah, I, I mean, you could build an <laughs> electrode twice as big if you needed to run it twice as long, you know, um, and maybe the surface area ratio, stuff like that. Maybe the geometry of that electrode is more is very important too. Uh, uh, is, it, is it a cube? Is it a cylinder? Is it flat? You know, um, is it a rectangle? Um, hmm. So all those things would probably factor into how long this battery could go. And, you know, it gets you into kind of rechargeable batteries too, where if you flip the current and you start stripping the silver that you've collected on the silver electrode, then you're going to have those copper two plus ions going back to your electrode, replenishing that electrode. <laughs> so, I mean, you could do, you could go back and forth. I think um, you're going to have to put energy into the system though, to flip the anode and the cathode. These yeah. are spontaneous. So they're going to happen because you designed it correctly. Um, but if you wanted to flip it, then you gotta, you gotta put electricity into the system to kind of run it backwards as well. And I'm not okay. 100% sure you can do that with a galvanic cell, but. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. That's the, uh, I've, I've, I've got all kinds of ideas about that. So <laughs> let's, let's move on to that next slide. I, I won't get weird here. <laughs> oh. That all is right. the next slide, right? Uh, probably, man. I, uh, <laughs> I've been swamped at work and I don't. 100%. I got you. Me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, so basically what I found was this paper um, and it's from 2013. Yeah, perfect. Okay. That matches up with what I have. So this is from 2013 and it's a, um, it's a review article and basically review articles are not 
uh, uh, like original research. What somebody will do is is search the literature. Uh, you know, a lot of times their procedure, if you will, will be that you know we search PubMed and anything with this word, that word, or the other word um, that came up under soil or you know whatever their keywords were. Uh, they'll pull all the literature and try to consolidate what other people have found into one comprehensive review. <clears throat> so I thought this paper, I found a couple other ones that were very interesting. And this paper, the nice thing about review articles is if you don't know a lot about the subject, it, it encapsulates a lot of it into a, a digestible portion. Instead of having to read 37 different papers, you know, if you find something interesting, you can always use their references to find the original paper. But anyways, uh, this is the redox potential EH. And uh, <laughs> Elka was asking me why it's called EH. I don't know. <laughs> it's electrical summit. I, but pH, I do know. It's the negative log of hydronium. Um, as drivers of soil, plant, microorganism systems. And uh, this is what really kind of tickled my fancy was this multidisciplinary um, approach to uh, soil in a sense. And the redox potential of soil in a nutshell is more or less about how aerated your soil is. So if you're in a swampy bog, you're going to have a negative reduction potential within that soil. And from the numbers that I was looking at, it's between like negative 300, negative 100 millivolts. Um, whereas on more upland soils and even some of the uh, old growth soils, you're looking at more like 200 to 500 millivolts for a healthy system. And at the end of the day, you want to have, it seems, it appears you want to have a positive reduction potential in your soil that indicates that you're in aerobic conditions. And there's like some thresholds about, well, under 200 is anaerobic, over 200. And, you know, that's all well and good. And at the end of the day, it depends on what you're growing. Um, but like swamps and stuff will have a negative reduction potential in the soil. Well, it's waterlogged. There's no oxygen. It's hard to facilitate those redox reactions because oxygen is such a good oxidizer. <laughs> um it's really good and that's why we, the name yeah right and uh you know that's why we don't have 50 percent oxygen in our environment because a lot of it's tied up uh in minerals that underwent these reduction or these redox reactions to make phosphates and the oxo irons and all the other elements that we find in soil a lot of them are going to have an oxygen molecule um nitrates is another very obvious one and uh, if you look at the back of like hydroponic fertilizers, it's K2O. Um, again, I think that's to help oxygenate your water, but I don't know if it really works at those concentrations. So the really cool thing that I found was if we go to the next slide is these diagrams and it's French. <laughs> I probably said that wrong, but these diagrams I, I thought were really neat in the fact that you can quickly look at, at this and let's say if you had a reduction potential of 400 millivolts or 0.4 volts and you're at a pH of like six and a half, seven, then by, you know, going up and over, you're on this threshold of having Fe2 plus, which is what the plant prefers to uptake. And this FeO3 uh, with some amount of water uh, coordinated to it. And if you need to figure out the oxidation state of the iron, what I the first thing you do is that oxygen is a negative two. So I got negative six uh, charge, if you will, by having three of those oxygens in the compound. So that means that the iron has to be plus three because three times two is a positive six. So now you're charge neutral, you have a molecule that's pretty happy. Um, but this, uh, this form of iron is not that accessible to the plant due to its oxidation state. So this is where you can start to put pH and the reduction potential, because that's the y-axis is the reduction potential, the, and the x-axis is the pH. 
And now you can start to take that chart that we looked at last time where it was just pH and how uh, and nutrient uptake. This gives you another layer of detail of, of, of nutrient uptake based on the potential of your soil. So again, if you've got negative reduction potential, you're going to have elemental iron. So you're going to have iron zero. If you jump to about, and you know, I'm just ballparking here, but about 200 millivolts with a, a pH of about 6.5. Now you're in the zone where that iron is available to the plant in its, you know, native form or its preferred dietary form. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I mean, you got to think of them like people in a way, like, you That's know, how I do it. Like we, we didn't just magically appear. Like we've evolved from these little things, you know, all these little <laughs> systems that got together and, and, you know, that gives rise to lot higher, higher life, which blows my mind. But um, yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, let's keep on that just for a second because sure. it, it, all of this oxidation talk is reminding me about, I, I told you before that I've got some uh, friends that are healthcare professionals and all of that. And yeah. one of them told me something very, very profound once. And he, he said that uh, healthcare can be uh, boiled down to two things. The uh, trying to slow down oxidation and inflammation. Right. It's like, that's really, it's like uh, slow down death and pain because it's, it's really just uh, us living is like a fight against oxidizing away and decaying. And yeah. that's why our cells replicate because we need new ones. But the, uh, Anyway, that that really that it really simplified his job to I mean just that those two little things and it, you, and we've already talked about it with the fever few and then all of this oxidiz oxid eh, oxidizing that you're talking about so oxidation there you go so that's a anyway I'll quit being a pothead over here and let you get <laughs> back to your your thing but it's it, it's fast this is really fascinating to me and it's cool that they used iron because that oxidizing iron is something that everybody's familiar with right uh, rust. rust is yeah. yeah rust is a very common thing and that's that's essentially what we do as we live as we rust away we're just yeah. not made of iron so okay and, uh, and like the statue of liberty used to be copper and now it's an oxidized form of copper that gives off a green hue yep, yep. you know it's uh yeah you're totally right and the the really great like what triggered immediately was the first uh sentence of this paper is what drives life is a little electric current kept up by the sunshine. And I mean, <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that's it. yeah. yeah. Simple, like simple explanations like that can't be beat. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's someone that knows exactly what they're talking about because they were able to say it so succinctly that it's almost impossible to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Oh man, this is, that's why I was so excited about this conversation today. Cause this is a, I mean, this is the, the ultimate subject for me. And it's like, the, this is what matters the most in my opinion. So, all right. Uh, uh, teach me some more, man. All right. Let's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So you can see that, you know, iron prefers to be in the more or less two oxidation states, plus two and plus three, uh, unless you count the zero oxidation state, which is totally legitimate. Um, some metals, most metals are pretty obedient well behaved when it comes to oxidation states now something like nitrogen can have an oxidation state of, of anything from minus three to a plus five and carbon is the same type of way where it can go from minus four to a plus four so these organic molecules have much more like fluidity within their oxidation states that allow them to give rise to a vast array of different um different organic compounds and uh, in organic chemistry, when you think about oxidation and reduction, the easiest way to, I think the easiest way to do it is, did I add a hydrogen? Then I reduced it. Did I make another carbon oxygen bond, nitrogen carbon bond? Um, then I oxidized it. And really it's nothing more than just what's more electronegative. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. It's going to have a tendency to hold on to those electrons a little bit more, if you will. And it's really just a bookkeeping method. This is not like some profound physical reality thing. It's just a bookkeeping method that says, 
the oxygen is more electronegative. It's going to pull that, that electron within the bond towards it a little bit more, giving a little bit more positive charge on the less electronegative atom, which would be the carbon in this case. But uh, so that's the oxidation states. This is the uh, Poibois diagram for iron. And then I think the next slide should be the same diagram for NP and K. So this is, again is, is like, for me, I don't know plants well enough to be like, oh, it wants H2PO4, not PO4 three minus. Um, so this diagram, I mean, I looked at these and go, oh, perfect. <laughs> Only the plant knows that, man. I'll, I bet there's not a human out there that knows that shit, Sean. <laughs> right? <laughs> but this, this is at least a good uh, road to maybe go down when you're trying to engineer a soil system or, or, or remediate a soil system is to have these kind of things where it's like, oh, I took a measurement here and I got this many millivolts. What kind of nitrogen is my plant? Uh, what, what kind of nitrogen is available to the plant? So this is where I will honestly say that nitrogen confuses me. And if you look at the sweet spot of what growers are going to grow in, it's in an aerobic soil. So let's say two to 300 millivolts on the potential and typically around six, five-ish between six and seven, let's say for pH. And if I look at that correctly, then all of my nitrogen is in the form of, of di diatomic nitrogen or atmospheric nitrogen. So how is the plant going to take up something that A, doesn't have a charge, is a gas at room temperature, so it's, it's not very soluble in water. And if it is, it can simply dissipate away very quickly. Um, and this is where you have to look at another layer with the microorganism interaction. So if you have a desirable potential and a desirable pH for your bacteria and fungus as well, which again is at six to seven ish. And, you know, uh, Elka mentioned blueberries. Uh, I'm going to try to start growing some huckleberries, um, mostly because it requires a soil pH of around four and a half to five. Mm -hmm. And I've never dealt with anything that acidic in, in growing mediums. So I thought that would be a kind of a fun experiment. And then I'll have to find something that's an alkaline plant and, uh, and see, see the differences so that I can get better handle on engineering soils for particular plants. So this is where I immediately started to, to notice that your, um, your microbiota in the soil is going to play a huge role on what type of nitrogen is available to the plant, whether it be the fully reduced ammonia or the fully oxidized nitrate. If I was a plant, I would want fully reduced ammonia in general. It's uh, energetically expensive to try to essentially reduce a nitrate down to ammonia or ammonium, excuse me. Um, ammonia is uh, what from pH 9 to 14, an electrical potential of like negative 700. Ammonium, NH4 plus, is, is closer to um, the typical parameters that you see in soils. I think, let me interrupt here. I think that your assumption on that would be correct too, because plants are the most energy conservative thing that I have ever been familiar with. Like they, they really don't like wasting energy uh, and oh. cannabis is one that really shows you that, but as I, I just wanted to add that it's like, I, I, I think you're right on track with that. And it, I mean, it also tells you, if I remember correctly, like the azotropic bacteria is, or the ones that are going to break apart the uh, the N2 molecule prefer slightly more anaerobic conditions. Whereas, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, they would prefer slightly, very, very high aerobic conditions. And that's because they need the, the, the electrons from the oxygen to kind of drive this mechanism. But uh, yeah, I got off. Uh, I lost my train of thought. There. I'm, I'm sorry. That's oh, no, you're good. Responsible for that. It's... Um, a plant wanting ammonia, ammonium, right? Yes, that's what that's what I interrupted on because okay. you were saying that they they wouldn't want to the they were trying to conserve energy, oh, but, right. because they don't want to break down that ammonia. So um, so here's the other interesting thing that this paper uh, touched on was that they were saying I think up to sixty percent of photosynthetic synthetic activity is translocated 
to the roots and into the soil as exudates. I mean, it does a ton, the plant does a ton of work and commits a vast amount of energy to keep its soil healthy in that rhizosphere. So that was really interesting. I mean, that's a lot of energy, not to waste, but to allocate towards something that is not even your organism. I mean, it's just a huge level of cooperation in, in a way that I don't think humans would ever be capable of. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the closest thing that I can think of to it is like a farmer. Like they're, they're, essentially you were describing a plant as kind of like a microbe farmer or a microbiome farmer, keeping right. their, uh, doing what they can to keep their soil. And what, what else would you do if you were stuck in one spot, you know? I would attract it's, as much attention as I, as I needed, right? Like to get my meat <laughs> done. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that, that's really cool. This is, I knew this was going to be a really good one, man. So sorry, I, I'll quit interrupting you and just let you oh, do your good. thing. It's really, uh, yeah, I, I love doing the improv where I got to come up with the answers on the fly. It really sparks my, uh, my brain activity. So it's always fun. <laughs> um, and then, so on the right side is the same type of diagram. You can see how much more complicated it is for phosphorus. And again, we're looking at a triprotic acid. So we've got H3PO4, we got H2PO4 minus, HPO4 2 minus, PO4 3 minus. And that goes back to the last time we talked about buffer systems and all that kind of stuff. But again, from what I read is that the plant prefers the H2PO4 minus version of this um, compound versus the more, uh, or the, the more oxidized ones uh, like the H. PO4 2 minus and the PO4 3 minus. So again, you can kind of see that there's a sweet spot um, to get that H2PO4. And again, between six and seven, if you go up, it looks like if you keep this stuff, it was weird to me when I was looking at this because when you, at first glance, you're like, well, how come everyone's complaining about phosphorus deficiencies? Like it looks like everybody that's growing hydro soil coca like they're all in that h2po4 you know area and it's a really large area from you know essentially negative 200 millivolts all the way up to a full volt so there, I, I wasn't able to rationalize that very well at least for my liking but it, it's just kind of weird like i guess i don't understand why you wouldn't just water with with acidic water and keep the bulk pH of your soil around seven. But that's maybe a better question for Elka. He might have experience on that. Um, so yeah, that's those are those uh, Probois diagrams. And you'll notice that I put MPK in there and there's no K. Um, I was going to ask that. I see no <laughs> potassium. Because <laughs> uh, I'm a tricky little guy. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's nothing like this for potassium. There is, there is actually a, a chart like this for potassium. It's not very interesting. And the reason it's not very interesting is because it's a group one element. So it's always soluble. So there, it, the pH doesn't matter about trying to get the potassium into water. Hmm. And if anything, it's just going to change the potential. Slightly, okay. Depending on the concentration because it's and a positive cation. Yeah. You taught me this uh, two or three shows back, I think. Uh, I remember this this conversation in the past. So was, that, that was a stupid question of me, I guess. That's, that, that's, that, you, was that a test? Is, uh, see if anybody asks why, why there's no potassium here. That that was really cool as, because as a, I completely forgot about that. As a student, I always liked when professors would kind of do this to us because I'd be looking at the slide and probably not even paying attention to what he's saying or, or she was saying or whatever, but... I'd be like, how come no K? What's with the K? And then if you remember the, you know, <laughs> the information that you've already learned, then it's like, oh, group one element, it's always going to be in solution. There's really no need to adjust the pH to get potassium into my plant. <laughs> you could do it at two, you could do it at 10, because it's just going to dissolve into water. And whatever it bonds with again, it's just going to dissolve again. So you, and, and if you look at it, they're very, it's a very grid. It's very big rectangles where, you know, but so yes. All right. Okay. That was, that was cool. Everyone's Next slide. Fun. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I do that one uh, twice? 
I don't know. Let me see. It looks like it. So I guess we can go to the next, next slide then. Oh, hold on. It's not jumping all the way down like it did last oh, time. Oh, okay. Oh, there. it's because I changed the, I zoomed in on that last one so that we could read it a little better. Ah. So go back out and then yeah, and we can read this one. All right. So this is where I think, you know, this was the whole point of the paper in a way was this guy was trying to figure out what kind of optimal soil potential and pH is really going to help plants thrive. This is a very busy slide and I'm just looking at the center. I just love yep. how all the sweet spots right in the middle. That's beautiful yep. and elegant, just like nature. Yep. And when you start to tease through that paper and it was a doozy, it was like a 30 page review paper and I only had a chance to read it twice, but I'm going to have to go back over it again because first off, I was very anxious that I wasn't prepared to talk about any of this stuff, but uh, it was so dense about the implications of, of reduction potential in soil. And if you look closely, you'll even see that near that, that uh, sweet spot, the favorable conditions, there's virus. <laughs> there's fungi and bacteria or pathogenic fungi and bacteria. So this, this potential went in, this potential and the interactions between plant microbes and nutrients was what this paper was all about. And it was so dense, but basically in the right potential with the right, or, uh, uh, you know, good pH, maybe not right is the wrong word, but um, in the sweet spot, you're going to be preventing disease, uh, whether they're pathogens or viruses, you're going to be optimizing nutrient uptake um, due to um, the redox chemistry that is going on, especially with those transition metals in the D block of the periodic table. And if you look around, as soon as you go to a pH of, let's say, 9, and you're at about, I don't know, 500, 600 millivolts, all of a sudden you're looking at mink, uh, excuse me, manganese, zinc, and uh, iron deficiencies. You know, if you're at a lower redox potential, let's say at 450 millivolts, it looks like you're in a phosphorus boron deficiency. So what's really, really cool, I thought about this final diagram, is that if you want to do a living soil in a raised bed, or if you want to learn how, how to build soil systems or, or at least have fun with like the concepts of building soil systems, this chart basically tells you everything to do. Make sure that your pH isn't too high or too low and make sure that your reduction potential isn't too high or too low. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then, uh, basically, I'm going to try to use this guy, and whether it's in cocoa or or, or dirt, um, see if I can optimize, you know, my growing medium off of this type of, of rationale. Um, so that was very cool. And the other paper that I read was on the resiliency of the microorganisms in fluctuating conditions. So they use uh, tropical soils. Um, and it sounded like they did that because of the fluctuations that tropical soils typically incur, where you have a monsoon season and then a dry season, or, you know, you have very dramatic uh, swings in your reduction potential. And what that paper was looking at was the biodiversity of the microbiota in the soil. So after about you know, two hours after a flood or a really heavy rain and the, the water is saturated, your reduction potential drops very quickly. As it dries out, it increases back to, back to a, um, a more standard state, if you will. <clears throat> but those microbes have to evolve or adapt within that first two hours to, to a couple days in order for them to procreate and regenerate uh, their population. So that was really interesting on how the reduction potential of a, like, let's say a catastrophic event in a way, how that will disrupt the reduction potential and put pressure on the microorganisms to get to a place where they can survive long enough. And so they get back to their, their more um, 
desired uh, system. You know, this is where it would get into uh, facultative anaerobes would be ideal during a flood because they can go into an anaerobic metabolism, wait for stuff to dry out, and then go back to an oxidative metabolism. So they can go from glycolysis and then switch over to oxidative phosphorylation and a citric acid cycle. Uh, I didn't look into too much of metabolic pathways of those guys, but um, those are the big three metabolic pathways when you're talking about uh, ATP or energy production in humans and in mammals and, and pretty much all life has one, one or all flavors of those pathways. But yeah, so another interesting thing is as, as the reduction potential goes up, those, those uh, bacteria's metabolism goes up. So that consumes oxygen, which then lowers the reduction potential again. So if I had to put this paper in a nutshell, it's, it's all about balance. If you have good soil with healthy microbial community with good aeration. And again, this is where earthworms would come in where they're going to start, you know, digging their tunnels and aerating the soil and yeah, they're pooping out nutrients and that's great. But if you're at a pH of 10, I don't know if an earthworm would live there, but uh, if you're at a pH of 10, those nutrients don't do your plant any good. So this is kind of a, this is a little bit more of a rant because I, like I said, this paper was just so dense and I didn't have enough time to read it two or three times. So this is something that people are interested in. Uh, I found it on Google Scholar. Uh, it was free. It was open access. And if you're into soil and trying to play with the parameters and optimize, uh, you know, your ecosystem or your growing system or whatever, I think this paper would be a good jumping off point to get the kind of the verbiage under your belt and then dive into it to more specific uh, issues that you might find in your garden. Um, I guess the one caveat with this parameter is that it's, it's, it, it's not that it's hard to measure, but the measurements can be extremely inconsistent. Like if you're in the root zone or if you're in the rhizosphere and you're a couple millimeters away from the root, you could have two different pHs. They, they won't be drastic, but you know, your, your pHs are, you're going to have microclimates within the system. And that's what the plant is doing by pumping out uh, protons to acidify certain areas of the soil. That's what the fungi is doing when it's acidifying and mineralizing those rocks and those uh, heavier elements, those metals, so that they are bioavailable. So that's the hardest part with any of this microbiome, microbiota, is that your degrees of freedom are just so large that you could have a perfect pocket and never measure it, but the plant is thriving. And you measure over here and you go, why is this plant thriving? These are this is wrong. I have a negative voltage and my pH is saying that it's four, but in that beneficial pocket, and that, these are huge extremes, by the way, but, um, you know, this is where the plant is, is really dictating and controlling um, its own environment and its own health. So. Um, I'm over here trying to share that other, the uh, paper itself to show people what the, what that is and get the title up there again on give me a second almost there very cool subject sean thanks for the time today man and the time before like it, was, it, yeah. it takes some preparation for these things people he's got to like read it and refresh his memory on it it's like he's not fresh out of school you know <laughs> yeah, i'm not 25 anymore either <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it. Hear that. stuff's a little slower sometimes but yeah, I have a lot of fun looking back over this stuff. And uh, and I hope everyone's starting to see that it, it's going to progress. Like, you know, like the first episode was kind of a little, a little bland, but it gave us all the foundation to talk about, you know, solubility and the rest of the stuff. Uh, absolutely, man. It's a, I, I've loved the journey. It really, uh, that light, and you uh, exemplified it today with that little trick with that chart. <laughs> not putting potassium on there so that that was that was really cool it was like once you started explaining was like oh yeah he's already told me this before that's the, that's pretty cool so yeah it's a waste of time putting it putting it up there 
So yeah, uh, and, I mean, you can totally Google it and you'll see exactly what I mean. It's like, it's, it's kind of boring <laughs> <laughs> and for a reason, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, it's a big one. Like you said, this thing's uh 29 pages long and it, uh, I, I thank you for explaining what a review article was. Like I've, I've read a lot of these types of papers yeah. and when they, some of these titles, I just like kind of gloss over it and just read and try to find what it is that I'm trying to learn in them. Yeah. And it's nice to learn like so what some of these things mean when I'm, cause I've, I've never been to uh, college. So I, all of this stuff, I, I like reading stuff like this, but I've never been like trained in it. So it's, a, it's cool to have those little, little insights and, uh, things like this and i'll be honest this is i mean learning to read this stuff was maybe one of the most valuable things that i got out of like a traditional education or whatever you want to call it but i mean if people are into this stuff and they know where to find it you don't have to you don't have to go to college to read it you know there's a lot of smart fucking people that you know don't ever get exposed to this stuff because it's too highbrow. Like, oh no, that's a four year. It's like, no, nah, man, just read it. Yeah. See where you get, you know? Yeah. What can, you, can, like. you don't know what you can understand from it until you try, you know, yeah. that's how I see, I got into it. Cause a lot of this stuff's over my head. I've been reading a lot of law lately and stuff. And a lot of that <laughs> stuff's over my head, but oh, I still, I, I pick up what I need, need to from it. Like I know, I know when something is valuable to me. So it's like, and this, these abstracts, like that's what I love so much is before I get like deep into one of these papers, I always like to read the abstract first because that, that gives you a general idea. And then if you're more, uh, if you want to know more about one of the subjects in that abstract, then you go dig deep in the, in the paper. And then like he, he said before, uh, references, these things have references in them for a reason. And it's like, if you want to learn even more, start looking up those references. That's the same thing with laws and case precedent and oh, all of that. It's the, yeah. it's the exact same thing. These are yeah. these are sciences. Yeah. So it, here's the quote that you here's the quote that you quoted earlier at the very beginning. Like you said, the introduction. What drives life is a little electric current kept up by the sunshine. I mean, I read that and I'm like that. Yeah, and it goes on to say it's an elegant summary of Albert Schwarzenegger. Yeah. I didn't say that right, but I mean, it's like oh, that is uh, that is a beautiful sentence. Yeah, that's a, that that kind of elegance will win you a Nobel Prize, you know. So, <laughs> exactly. absolutely. So it's a and you know you kind of start thinking that way. That's a when you when you start learning enough about like nature and how things work on the, like this type of level, like what you were talking about today. Just and you you really do realize that electricity is everything, and it's the. Uh, it's all very elegant and balanced and it's, it's a wonderful thing. And it would be nice if people could uh, be a little more like nature in my opinion, but uh, it's, it's, it's nice that uh, little things like this are out there. That quote is, is beautiful. I can't wait to share that with my wife later. That's, <laughs> that, that's, that's amazing. So it's a, very magical. You know, all of this is, is almost magical. You know, it's a, it's a plant wizardry. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's kind of what chemistry was, right? It was magic until we figured out the electron and how a bond was made. And, you know, it was, but it was, it was kind of magic before that. It, it just worked. Yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it like, just is. So, um, I said, the, and uh, the simplicity of the worm, I'm glad that you brought up how, how, how the worm is uh, so integral to a lot of this stuff because they like like what you were explaining with the aeration of the soil and everything and they're good ph detectors and i imagine that they're good eh detectors too like we used to uh send electrical current into the soil to get worms to fish with you know you just hook a battery up to yep. two, two posts that you slam into the ground and worms come up uh, so it, anyway it's a, they 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 know what they want to live in and they don't like they, they don't like living in that kind of stuff. Did that just flash on everybody? I didn't see anything, but maybe. I don't know. Okay. Well, hopefully yeah. not. And another thing I would say, especially when you're, when you're, when you're reading through uh, review articles is, um, you know, if you go back to Google scholar and this paper's from 2013, what, where has the research gone 
uh, you know, as of 2022, let's say. And when I looked into it, it got it got trendy kind of. It, it, it was a lot of stuff on biochar and how that like affects the redox potential, which that's fine. It's just weird how everyone like seems to jump on this wagon of biochar, biochar, biochar. And then they go, well, you know, that's too much biochar. Like you overdid it. You messed it up again. And um, so that's another thing that I like about these review papers is, uh, is that you learn all the stuff that you need to understand the science, and then you can go find where the current research is at. And a lot of times it will just fizzle out. There wasn't anything to that idea really, or at least <laughs> a sustainable idea, you know? Um, so, yeah. All right. I see Peter pop. You, can you hear us, Peter? Are you available, man? You want to meet Sean? I don't think you've talked to Peter, have you? No. I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's been on one of these. He's a busy guy, man. He's, he's out there, got all kinds of kids running all over the place and pre- <laughs> I, preschool meetings. <laughs> that, that that was my day today. I, I didn't want to interrupt you guys in the middle of a chemistry con. See, I still have my preschool name tag on. Um, in the middle of a chemistry conversation, but that was awesome. Yeah, it's a, he's... He, he's really taught me a lot on these shows, man. It's like just breaking it down. And as I can, I can see the world in a different play, a uh, different way because of uh, these conversations. So that's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so, so what's up, Peter, what have you been up to, man? I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, well, I literally, so actually that lunch that I thought was the preschool lunch today is, uh, oh my God, look at this. Here's number three. <laughs> say hi hello hello <laughs> can you go and then where's number two number two just wandered out Valentina. anyway give me one minute i'll be back all right all right <laughs> papa Cerveri. <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember if it was uh richard Feynman that had it but uh and I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something about like how science destroys like the beauty around you. And I just, I disagree so strongly that understanding how things work just makes it that much more gorgeous because of the intricacies that it does. I, I don't know. I mean, the complexity that, that emerges from these systems, it's like, it's mind blowing when you actually think about it, you know, it's not taking away anything. It's only enriching the experience in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does mine. It really has. It's like I, I see things a little bit differently. Is it like uh, like today I'm going to start thinking as, as what I'm doing out there with my uh, compost bin is I'm making soil rust, essentially, you know, <laughs> I, I, anyway, it's the little weird stuff like that kind of gives me a giggle when I'm out there working hard. <laughs> it, it, little things like this, uh, like it, it, it's fun to think about because you're not, a, I'm not one to like put earbuds in or anything like that because I don't like that stuff in my ears. So when I'm working, I'm just in my head, yeah. you know, so I'm listening to the the sounds around me and what what's what it's, the thoughts in my head. So you've added a lot of interesting thoughts when I'm out there uh, playing in the earth. So thank you. Yeah, anytime. It's been a lot of fun and yeah, it's been an interesting journey on my side as well. Uh, so did you have anything that's like, what, what's next? Like, where are you wanting to go next? Jeez. Uh, I mean, we could go back to like that Valerian type uh, format where take a plant and uh, look at its metabolites and secondary metabolites and connect them to human health. Uh, if you want to keep going, I mean... Another general chemistry type thing would be on maybe light. I'm talking mm. about photons and Planck's constant and all that fun stuff. Um, okay. Well, let, uh, on yeah, that I'm one. Up with I, anything. <laughs> okay. I, I like that I idea. I would like to hear all these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, the, uh, the plant one for sure. It's like I'll do a little research on Feverfew and UK. I really want to do one on Feverfew because that. That one really helps, man. It's okay. like everybody have has headaches, you know. It's it doesn't taste great. I will. It's like a, anything else out there in nature that usually works. Right. It's not. You gotta you gotta take your medicine, you know. It's like medicine isn't always the most pleasant thing, but. Well, it's almost like an evolution to to not poison yourself. Ah. Because these are really 
powerful compounds and the, the fact that they don't taste great means that you don't want to keep eating them either. And uh, Good point. cinnamon is an antifungal, I think, for, for the cinnamon tree. Um, so a lot of those compounds are defense mechanisms because they can't get up and move. So yeah, if you eat too much of them, you make yourself sick and, and that's kind of the point. Um, but they do have huge medicinal value as well. All right. Uh, and as far as light goes, is like light's fascinating also. And uh, what I would like to do with that is uh, I'll do a little research. I'll go back through Bugby and I'll see oh, like cool. some, where some of the holes are. And then we'll, we'll see if we can fill in some of those holes because there's really no sense in reinventing the wheel with what Bugby's already done. Yeah, he's, he's, he's done a lot of research. Yeah, yeah. So it's he's had a lab and all of that and plenty of years to cover what he's covered. But I'll go in there and see if there's any like any holes and places, any corners he hasn't been able to look in yet because he hasn't covered everything. I he's actually, covered a lot. I just saw him uh, down in Vegas. He was at a conference and he gave a really good talk. And I wish he had, you know, more than 15 minutes to, to give it because, yeah, he's he's he really knows his stuff. And it's so, so fun to listen to him talk about it because yeah. it's good information. It's it's really solid. Yeah. And he, he speaks uh, clearly like you do. Like you don't, you don't yeah. stutter a lot like I do. So it's, it, you, you're a lot easier to listen to as him. And uh, uh, you remind me of him quite a bit just on the, uh, on the chemistry end. Thank so, you. Uh, That's very yeah. fun. <laughs> That's, hey, as a, call him as I see him. So, <laughs> as a, I guess Peter, he's busy with the kiddos. So uh, uh, if you want to, we've been on here just a little over an hour now. So this is get on with our weekend and, Sure. Uh, so I'll I'll see you. I don't know. We we don't really schedule these things until <laughs> they, they it works out. You know. Yeah. So it, uh, is there anything like that you that want to talk about, Peter? Yeah. No, I <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you want to do another um, uh, kagyu conversation. Oh, absolutely, man. Those yeah. plants are looking really good, especially with the weather we've had. It's kind of amazed me. These plants are very nice. Is, am I, am right. I am I echoing or is that? I don't hear an you? echo. Okay, I, it's in your head. It's all in my head. I, I, I believe that, man. <laughs> so this has been a really nice break, man. I like to get away from the real world and talk about the real world for a little while. Yeah, it, right. That makes any sense, you know? As, Absolutely. So when are you thinking on that uh, Kagyu thing? You just gonna shoot me an email and see when everybody can can make it? Yeah, why don't we just do you and him, and then once he can do it, you can just let everyone else know. Uh, All right, kind of when it's happening, and that um, works. I, I'm I'm looking forward to talking to him again, man. I said those plants have really impressed me. Yeah, and then for anyone in LA, uh, we may be uh, hopefully starting up weekly LA events starting ah. potentially next Tuesday night. If, uh, I want to be super precocious about it with like four days to pull it all together, but it's a cool outdoor spot. We can smoke, we can drink, we can eat food. Uh, there's a little stage. So anyway. that's cool. I'm, I'm glad you finally made that dream come true, man. You've been working on this for a long time. Well, shit, since I've been talking to you. Well, to have, like <laughs> to have our own venue is the dream. This is at least a venue to do something in okay hey baby steps right yeah. you know what about bob style so so anyone in la hit me up and uh let me know if you want to come it's in santa monica so right off right. the 405 that's pretty cool that's yeah. I, I, that, that makes me happy man uh, so, uh, so when is this oh yeah you said it in about four days let's not yeah, say so too that, much before it's all set you know and people, well, oh, what's happening then yeah no if it's not this tuesday it would be the following tuesday but uh, i just want to get them started and then see where it goes but uh all right. and and you're you're mentioning this because you're planning on showing it on the channel i'm assuming why right? yeah I, I feel like if i start talking about it i can force <laughs> myself to do it there you go and yeah the, we, we, so, so the idea is like if if there's a conversation happening, we'd stream that live. And then uh, other than that, conceptually, the idea is like everybody bring your jars of whatever your dankest stuff is, whether you're a home grower, black market grower, regulated market grower, smoke everyone out and 
everyone have a good time. And then if like, like I talked to Tyler from Family Tree, uh, so if like he's there, it's like, all right, you're gonna get on the stage with whoever and talk about like depending on who is there, it's like you two get up on the stage and talk about this topic. Yeah, and then you're not the only celebrity there, Peter. You got trees there to help you out. <laughs> Tyler, in, Tyler, in LA, he's the man. Not a, not a single person knows who I. You you understand the LA market? The LA market is indoor hydro, like uh, cookies and. And that's not me. If we went up to like Santa Rosa, people would be like, I recognize you. But in L.A., not a single person. OK, OK. Yeah, you're right. I do not understand the L.A. market on a lot of levels. Hell, I don't understand L.A. on a lot of levels, man. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so uh, I just don't want I don't want to end this now because you're here, Peter. I haven't talked to you in so long. I don't even know what to talk about. That's, I, <laughs> Uh, so how's your garden doing? Like, what, what, what's, what's going on with the garden? It's, uh, I'm basically in the transition of all new stuff. So I'm like waiting for certain seeds to finish out. And then, uh, God, I don't even know what I have. I actually just right before I came inside, I was planting, um, uh, some white beans and, uh, yeah, I have some some can some seeds from Jackson Mean Gene that uh I had about 13 plants and uh those pollinated and now it's down to 10 plants and uh so I have some next door at the neighbors. I have some at baby mama number one's house. I have some at Chenzo's house who you've met on YouTube. And uh, so I was going to use those seeds for the medical program, which is starting to gain steam. So that's like, if you're a medical patient or a veteran or, um, you know, if you just pay for the shipping, I'll put a couple hundred bucks worth of seeds and other stuff in a package and send it out to you. But cool. I asked Jackson if he'd be cool with me, including kind of the stuff I'm doing from his stuff and uh he was down with it so that's, that's cool uh, he's, he's such a laid-back dude it seems like like he, he doesn't seem like he gets uptight about any of this shit. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> that's awesome if, if ever there was a saintly figure in the cannabis world of someone who's just like always nice always chill uh it would be him all right yeah i, I picked that up man it's a, I've, I've learned a lot from him also that's I bet he's a busy man right now. It's that time of year. Yeah. So, so he, he, he sends stuff in. We're going to do an upcoming fundraiser uh, for a wheelchair for a member of the family. And uh, so he's sending some stuff down for that. I just talked to uh, Bodhi, who's going to send some stuff down for that. And I got to reach, you know, for all this stuff is like when, you know, like chipping away at stuff, like carving out time to reach out to someone to explain <laughs> to them what we're trying to do to, you know, get closure on it. So, um, oh, so we're, I don't know if, uh, were you part of the, uh, of what I'm talking about? It seems like it, although I can't remember everything's a blur in my head of who I've shipped stuff out to. See, yeah, it seems like he was a recipient of your yeah, the program no, that you're starting up. Um, so I think with that, like, you know, it's like you think of stuff that makes you happy. It's like, that's kind of the stuff that makes me happy, but it's how do you scale that up without overwhelming yourself? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so in the background, what I want to do is find some people here in LA who can help kind of like, package stuff up to send out to people because every time you know it's like everything takes time so it's kind of like you know if i'm sending out two packages a day and then four and then eight and then 16 and then um you know at some point it's like all you're doing so. <laughs> yeah like when you start pulling down seed plants and have to husk all those seeds out or whatever Sift them or is, uh, okay. speaking of some of your seeds 
the uh, I'm, I just cleared an area and I'm going to be planting a bunch of that Asian cabbage again because it didn't do so well in the spring. I'm going to try to uh, it won't it shouldn't be bolting out as easily if uh, planted in the fall. So I'm I'm excited yeah. about this because it was really tasty. I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't get much. It started bolting immediately. Yeah. So I have your uh, your uh, basil, which when I planted it in the spring, I planted it with mullen and then the mullen basically just like completely <laughs> boxed it out. And so I just, uh, that's actually some of the stuff that like the seeds just sprouted up. So I'm going to start transplanting the basil. Uh, but just while we have cheddar Bob here. So my assumption is, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you're going to, uh, make some cherry pie clones available for the fundraiser. So if you are, I would recommend, uh, taking some cuttings now. So by the time we do the fundraiser that they've rooted, so it's, we can ship immediately versus like, thank you for your donation. And in a month we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to you. <laughs> Yeah, the people don't like that shit, especially oh, yeah. so with some of these prices. <laughs> awesome. Now, th and this is what makes me happy. And uh, and so I, I talked to um, Floyd from Hoku. Um, yeah, so the CBD stuff. So Floyd's going to send me more kind of high CBG, high CBD, uh, kind of different cannabinoids. Uh because what I try to do, it's like you don't know what someone's condition is, but so I try to send like, here's some high CBD stuff, here's some high CBG, here's some auto flower to get you something quickly, here's some Atoni stuff, which is definitely, you know, medical oriented, but more, you know, higher on the THC side. Um, yes, look at that, Cheddar Bob. That is the important thing. I will get on it. That's <laughs> that was the correct answer. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, so it can be because I want to do this fundraiser like how how I always want to do them is never how they play out. It's usually someone's like, oh, let's do a fundraiser for this cause. Let's do it in three days and like we're totally unprepared. And it's only the stuff that 99% of the people watching a fundraiser are like, that would be amazing to get that $500 pack, but I can't afford it. And so what I'm trying to do in the background is just have a bunch of kind of the everyman packs that people can afford. Um, so if people want to help out, they can get something for it. And that's uh, so that's like what I've been reaching out to people for. And but uh, so like yeah. Cheddar Bob's, you know, cherry pie cuts, like it's not something that's going to be bid up. It's just like, here's the price. And if five people pick one up we've raised a thousand bucks yeah that's a you're a good man cheddar that's a that's a beautiful thing as uh, i've been having uh, uh well since i've had this plant this thing i've got a plant that doesn't want to root on me man and it's like everything else is doing just fine and uh a, another thing that's amazed me about those ziawat nejos is there's one that i'm keeping inside that I, i'm just fascinated with and i can't wait to try it out but it's it, that thing rooted like the Easy, it's one of the easiest things that I've ever had to root, and it's like everything is like kind of amazing. Like a cutting, yeah, some cuttings. I was just, I was just uh, on the cutting thing since you got Cheddar Bob out there working now. As <laughs> I was, I've just I took some cuttings recently, and it, it reminded me that I have the, it confirmed for me really that I have this plant that just does not like rooting, it, it, but it's it's worth keeping, so it's worth the fight. So I've got a I'm gonna take some more cuts of it because I'm not confident in the ones uh, I, I didn't get enough for what I, what my goal was with that. So it's, anyway, it's, it's, why, why some roots or why some plants root so easily and others don't has, it's something that's fascinated me and it doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason to it because I use yeah. the same method and I've been using the same method forever. And it's just, some of them just don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have switched things up to see if maybe if I just straight in soil, it does it root better. So I have tried that, I don't, but I don't venture out too far to see if it's my method that some of these plants don't want to root in, you know, because I can kind of see where, I don't know if that's where you're uh, taking it over there, Peter, but usually you're like, okay, start switching variables and see if it's you, you know? <laughs> no, no, well, I, I deal with that too. I mean, I, you got me thinking because I've had stuff where like I'll take the cutting and I'll just put it in water, others where I'll take the cutting and I'll put it like in you know, a plug or something. And then, uh, I remember 
way back when I was using the turbo cloner, it was really effective. Um, and I know one of the things that like a Tony Boneyard cautions against is, you know, if one thing has, for example, a viroid and you have a bunch of other ones in there with it, they're all going to get it too. So it's kind of like, well, maybe if you're taking cuttings from multiple plants, you have like a, clo a turbo cloner or a, an aeroponics cloner dedicated per plant. Cause mm -hmm. I, 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 had, or I still have like a 48, uh, plug, uh, cloner, which for one plant, you're not going to have 48 cuttings. So I kind of want to get a smaller one and say, okay, plant a, all your cuttings are going to go in aeroponic system a. So if there's any issue with you, you're not going to contaminate plant B. Um, but it'd be cool to do a conversation with a bunch of people talking about their various techniques for cloning. Yeah, as, uh, Sean, have you done any cloning yet? Uh, have you played around with the, the razor yeah. blade? Yeah, we had some issues at work, so I, I took a cloner home and, and tried some different things to see if I could help my boss increase his success rate. Uh, I mean, if you take off of a sick mom, it's obviously <laughs> very hard to get roots. Yeah. Um, and oh, this what, is... what, what I found was, um, there seems, and I don't know if there's any science behind this, but there seems to be like, if you start with too wet of a root cube, let's say I've gotten roots really fast by like letting them dry out quickly. Hmm. And there's like, I found like there was almost, you could cycle through that a couple times and kind of drown it and then dry it out. And it seemed to really trigger root production, but I don't have anything to back that up. Well, that, that's, that's been my method because that, that is true that the uh, more air and uh, I use rock wool. I've always used rock okay. wool. Well, I've other, I've done other things, but I like rock wool. It's very, it's consistent. So uh, anyways, but I, I do exactly that. It, they may start off a little wet and it's not exactly scientific because I soak them for a day because you got to pH it. So I soak them in lemon juice for about 24 hours or not pure lemon juice, but water with lemon juice. Right. And uh, anyway, so, but when I pull them out of there, I just squeeze them and it's not like, it's not, they're not all the same amount of water in them, you know, so some are a little wetter than others, but I always let that dry completely out or as much as I can before they start wilting before I shoot them. And I have like a little, like a uh, large syringe kind of thing that I put in there to, to water everybody with. But uh, so that I, it, it's uh, it's actually like a, a small baster and it's got uh, markings on it so that I know how much water is going into each thing once it's dry. So I do try to do that is like uh, let it come, uh, dry out as much as possible and then uh, not really soak them, but get them wet enough because that air in there really does. That's why those uh, those air cloners work so well is that they're never even touching like actual water. It's just water particles or droplets that are floating around in the air. So it's a, I, I, when I first started out, I built one of those like kind of on my own with the tray, with the seed tray and everything. And uh, I, I really liked it, but I didn't like the messing with the big tub of water. And it's like, well, I've, I, as I've been growing, I've found the like the easiest and most like less back, back, eh, less back breaking way, ways for me to uh, uh, do things. And those cloners are just too much trouble for me. There's a lot of cleaning involved and all of that. And it's like somebody says peroxide. Yes, you got to be got to be on on it with the peroxide or bleach or whatever your preferred preferred thing is that you're you're using it with things like that. As I'm not saying run bleach in the water in a cloner. I'm cleaning it because the, the water it's like a fish tank. It's essentially it works a lot like a fish tank without a filter. And that since it doesn't have a filter, it's got some yucky shit that build up in them. You know so. Uh, so it, it's cool. It's a, you, you haven't grown a lot of plants, but you, you've messed around with cloning. That's the, that's interesting to me. It's like, you're, you're kind of ahead of the game in in odd ways, John. Well, <laughs> you're starting from a different path. Yeah. A problem crops up at work and I go, do you want me to try it at home? And he goes, yeah, sure. And I go, all right, this is what I found, you know? And uh, that's what I kind of like about my job as I don't have to, I'm, I'm not in a defined role. It's like, Hey, we're having trouble cloning. Any way you can help? It's like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I don't know. That's cool. Those are the kind of jobs that I like too. Is not 
no definition. It's like you're just you're the dude that does these things, whatever we well, tell also you. Well, the to kind do. of people because it sucks when someone's like, "That's not my job," and it's like, "All right, it's not, it's not anyone's job." But like, can you, yeah. can you look at it and see if you yeah. can help out and figure it out? Yeah, <laughs> you're you're getting paid today, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Like this is a job, but I still do it. <laughs> but just yeah. quickly, on on a slightly different note, uh, I, I actually I've been talking to Eric uh, recently, and uh, I I want to try to get him on uh, from HBK because I agree a hundred percent here. Like, there are so many people who are so talented who are having to potentially do thing like this is what Eric's really good at. And, you know, same with Tony and uh, Alex Hardy and a whole bunch of other people. And, uh, you know, they're the people who deserve to make a sustainable living. We should want them to, to make a living doing this because they're going to do great things. And, uh, you know, that's kind of always been my, like, personal mission like can i help these guys make a living doing this and because they so deserve to do so um so i i'm totally down with that uh that that's what's so beautiful about your site man is that the, there's a lot of people on that list uh, that, that, so you're you're not only just saying that like you're saying it now but after you've already like shown it so thanks peter yeah, we appreciate I, you. I, so, so what? What's helpful? Like, I'd love, like, again, getting like you to, or um, like Travis, or um, uh, there are a couple. Of, like Chad has been doing it a little bit, but basically just to bring a deserving breeder on to kind of for everybody to get to know them. Um, so, if you'd be down to do that, I'd love to have you do some of that in addition to some other people because I, I i like i can only do so much so if other people can be like i'll bring someone on and like eric you know i was like looking at my own schedule and i was like fuck like next week i have you know Gemma's mom's i think going out of town so i'm like i have Gemma for like seven straight nights and i'm like all right when could i squeeze him in like maybe in the afternoon maybe on a friday afternoon uh but if someone well, else could be like i'll talk shop with them and yeah i'd like to meet somebody new i've heard a lot about the eight you said you're talking about the guy from hbk right hbk yeah yeah i said i i've only heard good things and i know, I know nothing so it would be cool to just like kind of go in and it's like tell me about yourself man and he'll tell all of us because i'm not the only one out there he's one of those like you see him on some of the uh, on a few of the sites he's not everywhere you know, he's not ubiquitous, but as, so yeah, as a, that, that sounds awesome to me. So see when he's down for it and uh, at least uh, just make the connection and I'll take it from there. Yeah. I think even just having like a group of people to like, if it was you and I see Cheddar Bob, Smiley or whoever. Um, yeah. And even Smiley has seeds now too. So it's kind of like, I'd love to Smiley. I'd love to have you come on and, uh, kind of talk about your background and breeding. And again, it's like, can someone take the charge to bring on Smiley or bring on uh, like um, Pistol Positive, Levi. Like I've wanted to bring him on. He's another guy who's totally deserving uh, of people knowing who he is and, and what he's all about. See, um, and you just taught me something there. I thought that Pistol Positive was one of the female breeders. I don't know why I had that in my head, but I, uh, thanks for clarifying that for me. And Sorry we to interrupt. Some, we need some female <laughs> breeders too. So that's another thing is like if anyone uh, has any good female breeders, you know, it's not, it's not intentional. Uh... Yeah, the next tester thing that you do, so you should get some female testers too because females, in my opinion, are the best testers. They're the best ones that I've found. And they're very honest. Like they, they know what they like and what it, hell, we know this. We're men. We've we've been with women. They know what they like. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, although, although my wife only is brutally honest with me, not with uh, other people necessarily. 
<laughs> uh, gotcha, gotcha. So, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, we've, we've kept this man a long time, and I'm sure you've got something to do, Pete. Uh, so it, it was really nice seeing both of you again. and uh, You as well. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, 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 email, I'll, try, I'll try to check. Yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you emails. I'll also try to check in maybe over the weekend or next week or something. But uh, I owe you a call. And uh... All right. It'd be fun to catch up. Uh, it's, uh, it's good seeing Cheddar and everybody else in the uh, Chilbert and Smiley. Everybody, Shredder. All of you people over there the in the chat gang. also. Yeah, man. The it's, whole it's, gang's here. <laughs> I, I like seeing familiar names. Yes. Dude, man. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're a community here, right? So that's nice to see everybody. Uh, so I'll try to uh, make a little bit more time for this because I always enjoy it when I when I do. So, all right, uh, peace, everybody. All right, see, see you, everyone. Guys. All right.